product of Peel Brothers, Brooklyn, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, the Railroad Hour. And here comes our star-studded show train. Tonight, the Association of American Railroads presents transcribed the world premiere of a new musical play by Lawrence and Lee, Penny Whistle, starring Gordon McRae and his celebrated guest, Dorothy Warren Show. Our choir is under the direction of Norman Luboff, and our music is prepared and conducted by Carmen Dragon. Yes, tonight, another musical first is brought to you by the American Railroads, the same railroads that bring you the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the fuel you burn, and the multitude of other things you use in your daily life. And now, here is our star, Gordon McRae. Thank you, Marvin Miller. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, Dorothy Warren Schold is Fanny Osborne Stevenson, and I am Robert Lewis Stevenson, as we present Penny Whistle. <laughs> Fanny, news, wonderful news. Oh, Louie, they've accepted the poems, the Penny Whistle volume. The whole lot of them. They promised to make a beautiful little book out of them. Oh, why shouldn't they? I love them. Everybody else will, too. Now, Fanny, there was nothing in the marriage vows that said you had to like everything I write. Do you know my favorite? Bed in summer. In winter, I get up at night and dress by yellow candlelight. In summer, quite the other way, I have to go to bed by day. You've memorized them. How can I help it? They're all like songs. Each one sings a little melody, like songs I remember. Songs by Mother taught me in the days long ago. you like these little verses. They mean a great deal to you, Louis, don't they? They're memories, Fanny, of the days when I was chained to a sick bed. I couldn't run and play like the other boys, but I went voyaging nonetheless. My body stayed at home, but my mind went traveling, far beyond the counterpane. How wonderful it will look in print. Penny Whistle by Robert Louis Stevenson. Oh, I forgot to tell you, the publisher has changed the title. They're calling it a child's garden of verses. <clears throat> but to me, they'll always be penny whistle, the little piping sounds I make. You make a little sound like a penny whistle makes. 
And the sound comes from your heart and soul The world around you shakes If you're true to tiny whistle It'll make a little tune And soon your penny whistle sound Is floating to the moon It travels like a thistle To India or France Just blow your penny whistle And the world begins to dance So fill your song with heartbeats And love and everything And then your penny whistle Will make the whole world sing If you toot a tiny whistle, it'll make a little tune. You see, Fanny, I'm cursed with the disease of optimism. I write a handful of three penny verses, and already I've made myself immortal. <laughs> so fill your song with heartbeats and love and everything, and then your penny whistle. Wait until your friend Henley hears about it. Louis, really? How can you hope to outlast the flimsy paper of this edition by writing nursery rhymes? Perhaps I'm not gifted with your profundity, Henley. I write what I can. Take this story. The magazines printed it because it amuses the 12-year-olds. But how long can you cater to them? This isn't the stuff that makes books, treasure maps, and yoo-hoo-hoo and a bottle of rum. I like it. I like Treasure Island. Oh, be quiet, Danny. Henley, Louis, you should be wrestling with the problems of existence instead of writing, Where Go the Boats? Dark brown is now, the river, Golden. Minute. Wait a minute. I don't like the way you read it. Fanny, my love, say the verse the way it should be said. Of course, Louis. Dark brown is the river. Henley, advocate of the deep. There it is. Simple, unprofound, a child song written by a child. Mm. Overgrown, perhaps, but a child. No wrestling with angels, <coughs> no demons or devils. <coughs> exactly what you said it was. <coughs> a nursery rhyme. Oh, Louis, are you all right? Of course, my love, I'm all right. I'm not dying. One of these days, soon, perhaps, but not quite yet. Huh. That's no way to speak. You must defeat death, Louis. You must be the master of your universe. Um, here. Here's a poem I've written. Read it. Perhaps it will strengthen you. Now, what a flourishing title. Invictus. Fanny, listen to Mr. Henley's formula for mastering the universe. <laughs> Night that 
as me Black as the pit from pole to pole I thank whatever gods may be For my unconquerable soul In the fell plots of circumstance I have not winced nor cried aloud Under the bludgeonings of chance My head is bloody but unbowed Beyond this place of wrath and tears Looms but the horror of the shade And yet the menace of the year Shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master. fine poem, a brave poem. But it's not true. God is the captain of my soul, and if God calls my ship into harbor, who am I to say the voyage must not end so soon? Oh, Louis, stop talking about death. Nobody's going to die, Fanny. There are too many things to do, too many things to see. Fanny, let's tell Mr. Henley here how we see the world in a nursery rhyme. All right, Louis. The world is so full of a number of things I'm sure we should all be as happy as kings There are stories to tell and music to sing There are flowers to see and birds on the wing The sandman to take you to lands of delight A sunrise to wake you and starlight at night There are winters and autumns and summers and springs And miles of smiles and loving heart things in a moment for Act Two of Penny Whistle. Just for a moment, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and picture in your mind a field of wheat and a railroad freight car. They don't look much alike, do they? In one important respect, however, they are very much alike. Both are essential if you and all of us are to have bread and flour and cereal in our kitchens. But standing alone, neither one can provide food for your family. For just as the freight car must be coupled together with other freight cars and a locomotive in order to bring you your bread, so America's wheat fields must be coupled up with grain elevators, flour mills, and bakeries in order to make your bread. And to do that calls for a mighty job of transportation by America's railroads. To carry out that tremendous and complicated job requires the closest kind of teamwork and planning. America's wheat crop in 1953 is estimated at more than one billion bushels. And stored in grain elevators is a carryover from last year of another three quarters of a billion bushels, making it a major problem to find sufficient storage space for the new crop. Right now, thousands upon thousands of railroad boxcars are busy moving this year's torrent of grain. And the freight cars will keep coming in endless lines, 
just as long as there's a place to put the grain. Then, as the wheat is sold, the railroads will move it on in a steady stream to the mills, where it will be made into flour and cereal and other basic foods for the tables of America. All told, this calls for the world's biggest single transportation job, a railroad-sized job. Now, here is Act Two of Penny Whistle, starring Gordon McRae as Robert Louis Stevenson and Dorothy Warrenschold as Fanny Osborne Stevenson. <laughs> There. Louis. Louis, what in the world are you writing? That looks like some kind of legal document. It is, my love. I have just given away my birthday. Your birthday? Mm Mm-hmm. I had a letter from a little girl who was born on the 25th of December. Terrible thing to have happen to a child who likes to get presents twice a year. So, I effected a transfer. Listen. I, Robert Louis Stevenson... Being in sound mind, and pretty well, I thank you, in body, do hereby make this grant. In consideration that Miss Annie H. Ide was born, out of all reason, upon Christmas Day, I hereby transfer to her all my rights and privileges in the 13th day of November, formerly my birthday, but now completely hers, to have, hold, and enjoy by the eating of birthday cake with candles, by the receiving of gifts, congratulations, and compliments, according to the manner of our ancestors. I charge her to use this birthday with moderation and humanity, said birthday not being as young as it once was. Miss Ide thus becomes a month and twelve days younger than she was, but will undoubtedly go on growing older from one November 13th to the next. The effect on the undersigned is more doubtful. Lacking a birthday, I may now live forever, or I might come to pieces like the one-horse shade at a moment's notice. Doubtless, this step is risky. But I do not the least regret that which enables me to sign myself your delighted name, Father, Robert Louis Stevenson. Oh, Louis, that's wonderful. And as for you and me, my love... We're going away. Away? I've chartered a little ship, and we're going to find ourselves in Enchanted Isle, Tahiti or Samoa. My love, are you my passenger, my fellow voyager? On every sea that was ever chartered. sing one of my songs instead of Tennyson's. Oh, well. He's the poet laureate. Mm. It's very singable. I wish I'd written it. Sweet and low, sweet and low in the western sea. Over the rolling waters 
must sleep? I don't know if I can. Have you said your prayers? Like a good boy? <laughs> no. But I shall. The one prayer of my life. Dear Lord, give us grace and strength. Give us courage and gaiety and the quiet mind. Can you sleep now, my love? I don't know. Sing to me, Fanny. All right, Louis. There's a verse that was written long ago by a young man I once met. Oh? A sailor, a, a hunter, a teller of tales, a dreamer of dreams. As a matter of fact, I liked him so much, I married him. Now, there was a foolish thing to do. And do you remember the verse? Oh, it's I that am the captain of a tidy little ship, of a ship that was a sailing on the pond. And my ship, it keeps a turning all around and all about. But when I'm a little older, I shall find the secret out. How to send my vessel sailing on beyond. Oh, it's then you'll see me sailing through the rushes and the reeds. And you'll hear the water singing at the ground. For beside the dolly sailor, I'm to voyage and explore. Land upon the island where no dolly was before. And to fire the penny cannon in the bar. Oh, my love, I'm sure the man who named the islands of the Pacific the Happy Isles the Enchanted Isles had a wife as wonderful as you beside her. Will we get there soon, Louis? Oh, my beloved, don't you know that to travel, hopefully, is far better than to arrive? Happy, my love, king of the island of Samoa. Half king, half exile. Are you sorry we came here? No, no, Fanny. I wish I could live it all over again. First sight of the first sunrise on the first island of the southern seas. Oh, why are you unhappy? I'm a failure, my love. I'm 44 and I have accomplished nothing. The men and women of this island adore you. The name they've given you is like music. Tusitala. The teller of wondrous tales. Oh, Fanny. And uh, may I quote my husband? So long as we love, we serve. So long as we are loved by others, I would almost say we are indispensable. Yes, when I wrote that, I was young and a little foolish. Life lay ahead of me. Now it is all behind me. Oh, no, Louis. No. Look there. Out of the window. Mount Bahia with its peak floating in the clouds. That is where I wish to lie, my love. Close to the stars, but still close to the sound of the sea. Oh, Louis, you are not going to die. <laughs> I have left a little poem. It will tell you how I feel. Oh, my love. My love. If I could only have left behind some monument in print. But shall I be remembered for a few jingles, a handful of magazine stories that lie in the dustbins? My father and my grandfather built great lighthouses, enduring lighthouses whose beacon lights cut through the dark. But my penny whistle has made such a, a little, little sound. Louis, Louis. <laughs> My dear Mrs. Stevenson, may one unknown to you share your sorrow at the loss of so great a man. May I tell you only that my sick child grows better as he reads your husband's brave poems. One stanza and the pain and loneliness seem to disappear. I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me, and what can be the use of him is more than I can see. <laughs> oh, Louis. Oh, my love. Dear Mrs. Stevenson, my little girl has a garden by her bedside, a garden of verses planted by your husband. My daughter is crippled, 
but she walks in that garden which belongs to the children of the world. How do you like to go up in a swing, up in the air so blue? Oh, I do think it's the pleasantest thing ever a child can do. Oh, my love, your little penny whistle sound is floating to the moon. So fill your song with heartbeats, with love and everything, and then your penny whistle. Well, my love, close to the stars, ten chieftains carried you there to rest and dream, and they have carved into the mountainside the words you wrote. This is the verse you engrave for me. Here now he lies where he lies. Dorothy Warren Scholl will be back in just one moment. And meanwhile, our hearty thanks to Lou Merrill, Patty Ironone, Stuffy Singer, and our entire company. Penny Whistle with special music by Carmen Dragon was written by Lawrence and Lee. The music of Where Go the Boats is by Ethelbert Nevin. The Railroad Hour is brought to you each week at the same time by the American Railroads. Marvin? In all this world, there's probably no bigger challenge in the field of transportation than the annual job of moving America's vast grain crop to market. Thousands and thousands of railroad boxcars must be in the right place at the right time. There must be sufficient storage space in the grain elevators. And the most careful advance planning is necessary if the tidal wave of wheat is to move smoothly and steadily to its destination. But above all else, it's the vast hauling capacity and flexibility of the railroads that make this huge transportation job possible. Thank you, Marvin. Well, that was a sweet, sad, and lovely story, Gordon. Well, you know, Dorothy, there's a story behind the story. It was a retired schoolteacher in Pittsburgh who suggested that we make the story of Robert Louis Stevenson into a musical play. Her name is Mary Eastman. She taught for many years at Patrick Henry Junior High School in Cleveland. Though she taught on crutches... Like Stevenson, the music of her penny whistle has echoed in the lives of the many, many children that she's taught. Thank you, Miss Eastman, from all of us. Yes, sir. A very big thanks. One of the best ways to build your future security and to save for long-range personal objectives is to invest in United States savings bonds through the payroll savings plan where you work or the bond-a-month plan at your bank. You help yourself and you help your country when you buy savings bonds. All aboard! Well, dear friends, it looks as though we're ready to pull out. And so until next Monday night in our 250th broadcast, The Frimmel Story, on behalf of the other members of the cast and of the American Railroads, this is your friend Gordon McRae saying goodbye. Railroad Hour was transcribed in Hollywood. Gordon McRae can be seen in Warner Brothers' The Desert Song in Technicolor. Our choir is under the direction of Norman Luboff, and our music is prepared and conducted by Carmen Dragon. This is Marvin Miller saying goodbye until next week for the American Railroads. Now stay tuned for your Monday night of music on NBC. the voice of